We're going to be in the book of Colossians. Surprise, surprise. At the end of chapter 3 today. And I'm going to start by telling you a story. I mentioned this a few months back, but I didn't tell this part of the story. A few months ago, I did the funeral for Barbara Cope, longtime member here at First Baptist. And every time I do a funeral, I sit down with the closest loved ones to just tell me about their, their loved one, their mom, their dad, their brother, sister, whatever. And I sat down with Bruce and Brenda, her two kids. And I always ask this question. Towards the end, I just say, will you tell me one word that describes your mom or your dad? Just, just tell me one word. And most of the time, they say love, and that's always a great answer. You want to hear that. That's positive. Sometimes they say funny. Sometimes they say a great cook, which is two words, but I get it. Sometimes they say laughing, traveling, all those sort of things. But Brenda sat for a moment. And then finally she looked up and she said, goal. Mom is the goal. Mom, she began to elaborate, is what I want to live up to as a wife, as a mother, as a grandmother, as a Christian, as a friend. And I thought, wow, what a testimony that somebody that has watched every moment of your life since their life started, uh, somebody that's seen your private moments, that's seen the moments when you get to just unwind and relax and get to be you, that they still want to be like you, that they still look up to you, that they still hold you in high esteem. That is a person of character. Because see, Barbara said it's not just as a wife and it's not just as a mother, but she said in all facets of her life, the way that she treated others as a friend, as a believer, I want to have a relationship with Jesus like my mom did. I want to treat people in the community like my mom did. I want to love my grandkids like my mom did. She's the goal. See, for Barbara Cope, what Brenda was saying, her daughter, is that where it mattered most, she lived it out. And that's the title for today, Where It Matters Most. Because, see, it's easy for us to put on the mask of Christian and go to work. It's easy for us to put on the mask of Christian and come to church. It may be easy to walk down the street with our dog and wave with that big smile painted on our face and be the Christian neighbor. But how do we do where it matters most? When we come home, do we take off the mask of Christian along with our shoes and we just turn into our true self? Because one of the most haunting and horrific statements is how you have heard people who are respected in their community are not respected in their own home because of the way they live. And so today, what Paul is teaching us is that we are to live out our faith where it matters most in the relationships and in the uh, responsibilities we have that are most pressing, that are most available, that we live in the most. So Paul has started chapter 3 with, since you have been raised with Christ, he says, then you should set your aim on Christ. You should set your mind to Christ. It's those first four verses. Chapter, I mean, verse 5, he says, because you've been raised with Jesus, then you should be fighting sin in your life. You need to put it to death, right? And we said at that point, you either need to kill it or it will kill you. That is what sin does. It either needs to be killed or it will kill you. And so put to death the sexual immorality and then the arrogance and the anger and all of those things. And then last week, Paul told us that we are to put on, right? We need to dress the part of a Christian. We need to put on humility and respect and kindness and meekness and compassion and patience and Cale took us through what all of that looks like last week. But it all starts with since Jesus has changed your life, since you have been raised with Christ. And so these last few verses of chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, he's going to talk about even more personal and even more daunting goal in life. The places where we are allowed to be our true self our true self should reflect the truth of what Jesus has done in our hearts and in our lives. This is where it matters most, and this should be most aligned with Christ. 
So he's going to break down into three categories today. Husbands and wives, parents and children, and he's going to use the word master and slave, but I'm going to make us think today in supervisor and the ones that are supervised, boss and employee. And all of us can find ourselves in those places. And the key phrase of chapter 3 that I've said every week, and even Kale brought up, changed lives live changed lives. That is the point. And so when our life has changed, we're different husbands, we're different wives, we're different types of kids, we're different types of parents, we're different types of workers, and we're different types of bosses. So let's jump into this. Starting in verse 18 today, it says this. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I'm going to stop there because we're going to break it into three sections today. You will notice that each time Paul addresses the submitting party first. He will speak first to the wives, first to the children, and first to the slaves or bond servants, however your translation says this. What I think is this is a reversal of expectations. He doesn't speak to the head. He doesn't speak to the one in charge. He doesn't speak to the parent first. No, he's reversing the expectation because he's bringing out that every party in this is in a mutual relationship. Every party has rights and every party has duties or obligations. Nobody is just told you're in charge and they have to listen. But everybody is given rights and everybody is giving obligations. So let's start with the most caustic and the one you want us to talk about first. So, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, Paul is not saying that wives are inferior or that women are inferior to men. At no point is he saying that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul is very clear. In the church, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is, male, there is no male or female, for you are all in Christ Jesus. Nowhere in the New Testament is it stated that a female is inferior to a male, that a woman is inferior to a man. Paul will bring up this idea of headship in line with the created order that God made Adam and then Eve, but he is in no way saying that one is more of more worth or of more value to God. No, he is speaking only in a matter of order, not of importance. That matters, okay? He then says, or then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. This is not a call to being a slave to a husband or being a doormat to a dominant man. That is not at all what Paul is saying. Literally, this concept is written, this word obey, is written in the middle voice, which is giving the women the choice to freely submit, it says. If you're reading the NIV, it says, submit yourselves. Paul is saying, and as you can translate this, it could be submit, or it could be place yourself under, or it could be sub subject oneself, or it even could be submit voluntarily. This is a willing choice by the wife to come under the headship of the husband is what Paul is calling the church to do. In a parallel passage, Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands. But do you know what he says in chapter 5, verse 21? All believers are to be submitting to one another. And then he says, wives, submit to your husband. The role of all believers is submitting to one another, trusting following and, and allowing to be led when it makes sense through this. Paul is not saying or subjugating women. He is saying your role in the family unit is to be submiss to submit as is fitting in the Lord. To allow the husband to lead as is fitting in the Lord. In each statement to the submitting party, you will see there's a reasoning behind it. For the wife, in verse 16, it says, or is it verse 18, excuse me, it is fitting. For the children, 
as it pleases the Lord. And verse 22, for the workers is because uh, it says, for fear of the Lord, sincerely in fear of the Lord. Okay? So, wives, verse 18, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, we need to be very careful not to read verse 18 without reading verse 19. So many people want to just read verse 18 and say, women, you should be submitting, and they forget what verse 19 says. Husbands, love your wife, and do not be harsh with her. Remember, everybody has duties and obligations and everybody has responsibility, or has rights. What are wives supposed to, supposed to be submitting to? A husband who loves them. Wives submit to one who loves them. Who, who is not harsh See, we don't need to be fearful of this word submit because what fear is there in submitting to someone who loves me and sacrifices for me and cares about my good above their own? That is how the family unit of a Christian family should operate. We're, we're submitting to the person whose goal in life is to sacrificially do whatever they can for my good. That's not scary. Why would we not want to do this? See, when a husband is called to love their wife, it's not called to say romantic things, to make Instagram posts of her, to tell her I love her, to give her a card every few weeks. No, that idea of love, what Paul is saying is you are to have an unceasing care and service for your wife's well-being. It never stops. You never give up. Paul will tell us in Ephesians chapter 5, he will say, husbands, you are to love your wife. How? as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. If husbands are loving like that, then I don't see any issue or any reason wives would not want to submit and say, you're the head. I want to follow your lead. I trust you. To love is to willingly sacrifice for the other's good. These are not weapons in marriages. You're not submitting. Well, you're not loving. No. These are the focus and our goals each day. My concern should not be how well is Carlin submitting. My concern should be how well am I loving her. And if that's my focus, I think everything comes into line. All right, we got a harsh transition, section two now, all right? We've handled that. Send your emails on to me as you want. Uh, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, this also can be parents, do not provoke your children. Let me find it here. Do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. I have told you guys that the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life is being a father. It is so challenging. I don't say that in a bad way. It just is a challenge, right? I've experienced more roller coasters of emotions than I've ever experienced in my life. Like, I have never been more tired in my life than since I became a father. But I've also never smiled as much. I have never been more frustrated in my life than with my child but I've never experienced more joy than what he can create either. And see, God has a really funny sense of humor. He typically lets me preach on something on Sunday and then gives me an opportunity to practice it about Tuesday. This week, he thought, you probably need a head start. And so we have been walking through. <laughs> Children obey and fathers do not provoke and love this week. See, Cooper is coming off 10 days with grandparents. 10 days of less structure, 10 days of more spoiling, 10 days of traveling on, he was on two different airplanes over that time. Getting back into a routine has proved to be challenging, we will say. Getting back to structure, getting back to expectations has been difficult. We were having a really difficult moment on Tuesday, the day back, First day back. Carla and him were in the car. They were driving in about Valley View. She gave me a call at the end of a rope and just going, I don't know what to do. I said, bring him by. 
I'll step in here. So Cooper walked in. I'm in the midst of studying this passage. (laughs) So he came in. He sat down in the conference room next door. It was very official. I said, have a seat. (laughs) Step into my office. He was scared. And every week when I start a sermon, I grab, I print off the sheet of paper, I print off the passage. And my first study of the passage is I start marking it up. And I grabbed the sheet of paper and I said, Cooper, come here and read verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. I said, all right, read it again. Children, obey your parents. Now read it again. We read it seven, eight times. I never got angry, never raised my voice. No, what I did is I sat there and, and my hope is rather than forcing him into submission, which I have done this week as well, I wanted him to realize that it's more than simply just he shouldn't be making mommy mad. That his role in our family, his place with God that he should be doing is obeying. This is how he can please God, is to obey his parents. And so we were talking about how do we make that make sense. See, it's not a new biblical concept. The fifth commandment was honor your father and mother, right? This is what we are called to do. But it's, it, it's my job to try to create an environment that is conducive for obedience. But Paul is very clear. Children, obey your parents. Now, with, with the wives, it was a voluntary choice to submit yourself. With the kids, it's not in the middle passive voice. It is in the active imperative voice. This is what you are to do. This is a command. Children, obey The only way out of that is if an unbelieving parent was causing a believing child to do something that violated the will of God. Everything else we obey. I don't like to brush my teeth. I don't like to clean up my room. I don't like to make up my bed. I don't want to do these chores. I don't care because children are to be obedient to their kids for it pleases the Lord. This is his role. When we look at kids and they go, how do I honor God? Please obey your parents. That's it. That's your job. It's not for debate or discussion at all. Children, obey. This is how we, I need to be teaching my six-year-old. This is how you love God, by obeying your parents. But the parents also have a role, right? Fathers, do not provoke your children and do not treat them in a way to discourage them. See, the parent in that time had a lot of power. When we studied the uh, prodigal son a few months ago, I told you that the father, when the son came and made the request, I wish you were dead, give me my inheritance now. The father had the right to have that child stoned. Fathers had a pretty big stick back in that day. But what does it say? Fathers, do not provoke your children. As parents, we have an obligation to create an atmosphere where love and value and acceptance are felt by our children. What does that mean? We are to create good soil for obedience, where they know they are loved and valued and accepted. We are not to place unreasonable demands on them, unattainable expectations, because maybe your verse says, maybe your translation says, so that they give up hope, they become hopeless because they can't achieve. No. We are not to cause them to be discouraged by the standards we create. No. We are to create an environment for obedience to be conducive. All right. Harsh transition. Section three. All right. We're close to the end, guys. Section three. Finally, Paul says, uh, he talks to slaves and masters. And I told you, we don't have a literal connection right now of slavery and Masters, but I want you to be thinking about this employee, employer, supervisor, supervisee kind of logic. He says this, verse 22 Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are not, you are serving the Lord Christ. And for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done 
and there is no partiality. Verse 1, verse 1 of chapter 4. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay. You will notice immediately that Paul does not write a thesis on why slavery is wrong. He is not trying to combat the social structure of the day. What he is doing, he's Christianizing it. He is not saying, well, the world's wrong, and here's the Christian treaty against it. Where do I nail it? He's saying, here is how we are. Here's the way we live. But here's how believers live in it. Here's how we live differently in it. Here is how we Christianize it. And so, what does he say? He says servants or slaves or bond servants or maybe you think of it employees or whatever you want to think of it. What are you called to do? You are called to do work sincerely. I think we have these on a slide that will pop up here in a second. So, do work sincerely. Verse 22 says, obey with a sincere heart, fearing the Lord. Understand that there's a greater master that exists. And obeying God means that we obey our bosses. He also says, do work honestly. So many people want to just do the bare minimum, don't they? What am I simply required to do? What's just my job and I'm not doing anything else? Or I'm only going to do it while you're watching. I'm only going to do it while there's eyes on me. No, do honest work. Do work heartily. Work hard. Is that how you're known at your job, as a hard worker? As a person that puts in the work? As a person who goes above and beyond? Are you the person that they're always waiting on? Always having an excuse come up. Always struggling with something. Do you care for the good of your company, your organization? Finally, we need to do good work. We need to do our best. Verse 17 had told us, whatever you do, whether word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do you do your best every time? You slack off? Shortcuts? Can you be trusted at your job to do what is right? Is your contribution helpful to the organization? Our Christian life, we can't just live in certain places. We have to live it everywhere, where it matters most with the people that see us every day. Finally, that verse, verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master. We haven't mentioned this yet, but when Paul sent the letter of Colossians, he actually sent two letters. There was this letter to the whole church, and then there was a letter to one man, one individual. That one individual would have been listening to this letter, but he would also have had a letter written just to him. His name was Philemon. He was a master. He owned slaves. And as he saw this person coming up, this team bringing this letter of Colossians, he also saw Onesimus, who once was his slave, standing beside the person reading the letter. Maybe even Onesimus was reading it. And as he hears this reading, he remembers what Onesimus had done. Onesimus was a runaway slave from Philemon who probably stole from his master and departed. And I'm sure as Philemon is hearing this, he is thinking, yep, Onesimus, you got to pay back. You have failed. You are not honored me. You did not work for me. You were just a people pleaser. You were da-da-da-da-da. See, Onesimus, this is how you should have been. And then he hears verse 1, chapter 4. Treat them justly and fairly. Last week we said, or two weeks ago, we said, oftentimes they were talked about as property, but they are people, and that's what Paul is calling them to. Remember, in the book of Philemon, Paul will, urge Philemon, uh, Paul will urge Philemon that Onesimus should be treated as a brother in the congregation. For Onesimus has been changed by Christ, and Paul is so confident that the change that Christ has made in Onesimus' life will make him a, change, uh, a person that lives a changed life. And Paul is also confident that the change that has happened in Philemon's life, the master that as a result of that, that he will also 
treat Onesimus differently than anybody else would because he's been changed by Christ. He understands grace, he understands mercy, he understands forgiveness, and now he gets a chance to show grace, to show mercy, and to show forgiveness. It changes everything. All of these things only make sense because God is God. Because Jesus actually lived, he actually died, he actually was raised again. And His Spirit is dwelling in us, sanctifying us, making us more like Christ. I cannot, by my own behavior, live the way that a husband is to love their wife. I cannot, by my own behavior, live as a parent towards my son. I cannot, by my own behavior, live as a good employee every single day. But Christ is working in me. His Spirit that dwells in me is making me more like Him, more aligned with His command on my life. So I want to end with, what does this look like? Imagine with me this situation. You have a man who has worked all of his life, but he's gotten a new boss. And for the first time in his career, he's treated with respect. He's paid fairly. And you know what? In turn, he does really great work. He cares about what the company is doing. He goes above and beyond because he wants to to do honest and fair and good work because he is treated with honesty and fairness. That man then goes home from a job where he feels useful and productive and he goes to his wife and, and he can't help but treat her with love because he understands how he is being treated and so he loves his wife and appreciates her and, and sacrifices for her. And in turn, she goes, wow, my, my husband is, is so caring and he is so sacrificial towards me. Why would I not want to trust him? Why would I not want to follow him? So when he says, hey, we need to move or hey, we need to look at getting this new car or hey, we, we need to change how we're giving and how we're helping others. Well, I trust him. I don't necessarily understand it, but I can trust him because I know how he cares for me and nothing that he is doing in leading our family will harm me. And then you have the kids. You have the kids who are watching their parents willingly submit. The mom submitting to the headship of the father, the father submitting to their boss, and they're learning that submission is not a penalty or a punishment, but it's for their good. When, you, when the one that is in charge is, or is leading is caring for you. So they obey their parents who have demonstrated to them over and over again that the kids are deeply loved, that they are valued, and they are appreciated. See, all of these relationships are intertwined. They all matter. And we need to be focused on living these out. This is not some archaic way of life. It's not a misogynistic passage. It's not a limiting or problematic way to live. No, it's for the whole family unit's good if we will trust God. So I have two sets of questions I'm going to ask you. First, husbands, are you loving your wife well? Intentionally, purposefully, sacrificially. Are you loving her well? Wives, are you submitting to your husbands, trusting and following them? Parents, are you creating a loving and nurturing environment for your kids to flourish? Kids, are you obeying the leadership of your parents? Workers, are you working hard and doing good work for those that supervise you, and are you doing it with sincerity? Bosses, are you treating employees fairly and justly? Are you paying them fairly and justly? I flip it now. Husbands, are you worth following? Are you worth following? Wives, are you easy to love? Children, are you taking advantage of the love your parents have for you? Parents, are you leading your kids well and in the right direction? For their good. Workers, are you giving as much as you want to get? Bosses, are you easy to work for? Too often we've used these passages as weapons against one another. 
But I urge you today to consider, are you holding up your end of the bargain? Are you living out the faith where it matters most? Because since we have been raised with Christ, it changes everything. It changes how we live. It changes how we speak. It changes how we fight sin. It changes where we aim our lives. And it changes how we work. It changes how we love. It changes how we treat those in our family. Are you aligned with Christ where it matters most? Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that we walk 